welcome. Can you hear me okay? Thank you for being here. This is a great turnout for a, such a beautiful Saturday afternoon. We appreciate your being here, but I think you're going to be in for a, a really informative um, conversation or a presentation, so I think you'll be glad you came. My name is Kirby Lambert. I'm with the Outreach and Interpretation Program here at the Montana Historical Society, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Doug Ammons, who grew up in Missoula where his father was a psychology professor at the university. He says that the Ammon household was run, quote, like a graduate school with all seven children having research projects. Um, <laughs> so my father was a math professor and I'm really glad he didn't make us do research projects because <laughs> I would have been really bad at it. Um, as a kid, he backpacked, swam, and sailed in the mountains and waters of western Montana. He explored both the currents and depths of Flathead Lake by becoming scuba certified at the age of 12. Um, so not, not only is he brave, he must also be pretty warm-blooded or something to be down there in Flathead Lake. Uh, he swam for the varsity grizzly team at UM, and he also began as a teenager an ex extensive career in kayaking. He received a doctorate in experimental psychology from the University of Montana with his main research in human motor skills. He's, for the past 25 years, also been a journal editor, um, helping scientists evaluate their work and improve their logic, methods, and writing. He has written two books and participated in making adventure films for National Geographic, ESPN, and Outdoor Life. He lives in Missoula with his wife, wife excuse me, Robin, uh, their children and grandchildren, and is passionately concerned about the world, the w about how the world works, and how to create a healthy, living, and beautiful world respecting the natural environment while acknowledging our place within it. I'm pretty sure that this book is his first venture into history. Is, is that correct? So um, we're, we're glad we have him on the history team now. So welcome, Doug Ammons. Thank you. So, we can't forget the commercial. This is the book we're hearing about. Our store will be more than happy to sell you two or three copies after the talk, and Doug will be more than happy to autograph. Thanks, Kirby, very much. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm uh, very pleased to see you, and I hope you'll enjoy the show. Uh, before I really get started into this thing, um, I mean, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to explain how I came at this, how it actually happened. So first, I never had in mind that I was going to write a book on the speculator disaster. I was writing a book with my wife about a fascinating Irish immigrant who came over to Butte in the 1890s and then was an integral part of pretty much every th remarkable thing that happened there. So he was actually the grandfather of a very elderly neighbor of ours. And so we were pulled into this personal thing with this very fascinating character. So I was only going to do a chapter on The Speculator because it was an iconic event in Butte and really in the nation. Um, and our character had a son-in-law who was a rescuer, and then his very next-door neighbor rubbing elbows six inches away was a guy named Joe Barnacote who was the top man standing there at the shaft of the Granite Mountain when the fire started. So you know as neighbors they talked. And uh, so after I'd gone through everything available, I was thinking I was just going to write this maybe 30-page chapter, just like a rock skipping across, just this very dramatic uh, event, but very limited. Um, so after I'd gone through all the available newspaper reports and technical reports and the... the uh, personal uh, letters and whatnot, I asked the archivist at uh, the Butte Silverbow archives, uh, is there anything more? And she said, well, yeah, actually, we just found this thing. So she had plopped in my lap this 600-page document. It's called the Coroner's Inquest. And what it is is set testimony from 70 surviving miners that it was lost for 90 years. And it was the first person as a writer or historian to ever really open it up and look at it. So just by fate, hook or crook, that's how this started. I opened the thing up and started reading, and immediately I was fascinated, frustrated, bewildered, puzzled, you name it. But, but I was also thrilled because there's really fascinating things that just popped out, but also was tremendously confusing. So I started trying to make sense out of it. I went in and I, in the restricted archives, I got permission. I started working with these uh, elderly mining engineers from Butte. And I dug out all these maps that probably nobody had looked at for 60, 70, 80 years. And um, I found out very quickly that the core maps, called the Stope maps, for the speculator mine were gone. Somebody took them. They never went to the archives. I don't know where they are. So I had to cobble together um, 
what the mine looked like underground from about five different other kinds of, of uh, mine maps. But I was able to do that, and then all of a s- and I was able to take the testimony that the men gave and put them in specific places in the maps. And so therefore, we could all, we, all w- together with the mining engineers, we could project ourselves right down into place. We understood. I was looking at the uh, archives here, the North Butte Company, every week. They're saying, okay, we took samples, we assayed here, here's where our headings are, we did uh, 15 feet of cross-cutting over here, and I could see exactly how the mine was progressing and what they were doing. So it just required sifting through and then using and trying really through a purpose to understand what was going on, knowing that this huge event was looming, getting ever, ever closer. So in making sense out of all that, I ended up making a 3D map of the mine and then matching the testimony to it. And so the men's actions started to make great sense. All the things basically that people were, had, had not been able to figure out because there was, was no information about them in the papers, I, I, could, I actually was starting to uh, figure everything out and it made perfect sense in many cases. Other things would pop up from individual statements that the, uh, that the uh, people testifying would say, just they would blurt out stuff. There was, it was such a powerful experience to them. They struggled so hard. That, and, and, the, and, the, and the inquest is just set for uh, a legal assessment of liability. But these men, you know, their hearts were so big, they were, they were so moved by this thing that they would just blurt out things. One guy would say, I'm not done with my evidence yet, and then, just, and, and then start just talking. And um, so I was able to take things like that and actually kind of enter the men's minds. And so with the... At mining engineers and this combination of things, I, actu- I realized that I could invert this whole thing. And rather than just a historical treatise on this, this uh, disaster and what happened to the men and, and, and their families in it, I could actually go inside them, their experience. And so I started writing that way, and all of a sudden the thing just came alive. And so that's how this thing came about. And, uh, you know, I figured out what the smoke did, why the mine worked the way it was. I was working with one of the guys I was working with, Butte Mining Engineers, Floyd Bossard, one of the world's experts in ventilation. Ventilation was a key thing with just guys getting mowed down in here. Um, Also, just the strategy, the North Butte Company, it turns out, was basically doing uh, an Apollo project. It was like a Manhattan project for mining. They were doing things that were unprecedented. A hundred years later here today, they finally have hoists that are raising at the speed with the amount of ore that they were doing in 1917, right? That was all lost. No one knows anything about that. Larry Hoffman and I are figuring it out, and that's, but that is the miu. That is the, 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 the thing that you have to enter in order to understand what these men were doing. With the, the guy who lit the fire, all these other men, they were all working within that context. So, in the end, really, the testimony and the maps and the interpretation, we inverted the, I inverted the whole thing and wrote it from inside the miners and the family's experience. So I invite you today to come along into the speculator mine. So we all have heard the stories of the early tradition of Montana Territory. The gold rush brought in people primarily in the 1860s. Of course, Lewis and Clark came through here. The Indians and various tribes have been here for millennia. Uh, the, the fur traders came in. But our story really starts with the inrush of the gold, people looking for gold. So that's really the 1860s. They came to Virginia City, Bannock, a variety of other places. They spread out across Montana Territory. They were looking for gold nuggets, for dust. They were looking to find their fortunes. And one of the places that they went was the Summit Valley, where Butte now sits. And when they got there, the first miners gazed at the silver bows of the, st- of the stream that, that went through the bottom right next to the hill. So what they did was they panned for gold, and they shoveled the, s- the gravel and the sands of Silver Bow Creek into their rocker boxes. They poured their strength into their shovels. And for some of the men, that strength, that effort, got them all the gold they wanted. But for most of them, it was a shoveling into a barren pile of rock. Now, lore has it that on the north hill there, the miners came across a small trench dug into a quartz vein. And beside that trench was a chipped and worn antler. 
Now, some old unknown man had taken that antler and dug into the ground, dug, tried to get into the rock. He'd pried pieces loose. He's probably following the, the glittering crystals that he could see in the quartz vein. It's probably iron pirate, fool's gold. And so what the man didn't realize was that below him there were mineral veins running more than a mile deep, and there were more riches than any antler could ever find. So to understand the hill, you have to understand the minerals of the deep earth. A granite batholith formed the 80-mile section of mountains that forms the continental divide, here from Helena down to Butte. Molten graminetic rock is welling up from underneath, and it gets near the surface, it cools, and starts cracking, gigantic cracks all through it. Below it is a big reservoir of molten quartz and superheated, superpressurized water, and filled with precious metals. And those get injected up into the cracks. And as it cooled, that makes the veins and the ore bodies and all the mineralizations. And it contained gold, huge amount of silver, zinc, manganese, and the richest copper deposit that had ever been found in the world. So these aren't gold nuggets, right? It's not silver. This is complex copper sulfide ores. They're called energite, calcopyrite, bornite, peacock copper, every color of the rainbow. Now to get to those deep minerals required a completely different way of mining. It required going from placer mining with gold pans and rocker boxes to hard rock mining deep, deep underground in the granite. And it required heavy industry in the middle of the Montana wilderness. So you had, had to have railroads that brought the steel to make these cages, to, to, make the hoist, to bring the hoist engines, the steam hoist engines. It required bringing head frame material, steel head frame, Eiffel Tower mechanisms is what they really were, big pulley systems is what it is, giant air compressors, smokestacks. Required bringing all the smelter equipment for the roasters, and the, the gigantic smokestacks to make hundreds of mines. And by the 1880s, the mines probably went five, six, seven hundred feet underground. And at that time, Edison had invented the light bulb, Bell the telephone, and some men really saw the future. Okay? Suddenly the world wanted copper and they found it in Butte. So we know the names of the copper kings. Daly, Clark, Heinze, there were dozens of other guys who were owners, not quite at this scale. Billionaires, multimillionaires throughout Butte. How did they do that? They saw the future, they realized the importance of copper, and they went for it. Now Butte quickly became Montana's powerhouse. It was a place where any man from any country, no matter how poor, could get a job, and the mines in Butte were the most well-paying, lucrative job that you could get in the entire world, also the most dangerous. So what happened? Men poured into the city from all over the world, more than 40 different countries. These are men seeking a new life with their families by themselves. They're willing to take a risk, huge risk. These are the faces of the men that made the modern world. And I love the little quotes that come because they, they're, they're so expressive of the attitude little girl or a, a teenage girl getting on the boat with her, with her father in Ireland, and the mother says, Lizzie, when you get to the new world, don't stop in America. Go straight to Butte City. <laughs> By 1906, the Copper Kings were out and the Anaconda Company was in. All across the hill, ownership was changing, and into that upheaval stepped a small group of canny investors under the guise of what was called the North Butte Mining Company. The first thing they did was they bought the old speculator mine. It was known for loose ground, bad air, hot, dangerous conditions. The shaft could hardly be kept in repair to keep the ore coming out. They then strategically acquired 19 claims on the top of the hill and down the other side. So the top of the hill, when you're driving by on the interstate, you can see one head frame up there, okay? That's the diamond. This all falls off to the east. And you can see from the, from the grayish 
claims that they go all the way out there. Why did they do that? Nobody had ever done that. Why? It was ridiculous. Here's why they did it. They had the smartest geologists and the best engineers in the business. They poured money into this, and this is why. Now, just watch. Speculators here. The Granite Mountain no longer is in existence. Nobody wanted this because there wasn't any ore on it. Why would anybody want a claim with no ore? Here's the shaft. Here's the Granite Mountain. Okay, now watch. This is just a fade. You can see that they took the, where the speculator and the Granite Mountain, they ran their crosscuts right through those claims. Why did they do it? Because it, it managed as a highway to create direct uh, contact with eight of the major veins of the hill. They suddenly, they figured out how to make this gigantic mine out of 20 small mines that were poor and unable to support themselves. This is a blending thing so you can see. So you see the uh, claims going out. Here's the Granite Mountain right here. Here's the, uh, the speculator. Granite Mountain, they made special use of that solid rock, that granite that had nothing in it, had no minerals, and they used it to create the biggest shaft, the biggest mine shaft and hoisting apparatus ever built. So this is an idea here just of why they did that. It's just an illustration. So you have the shaft, speculator, granite mountain. Okay, they go down at roughly 200 foot levels every time, all the way down to 3,700 feet. So these sheets are the ore veins. So what's an, an ore vein is where the water and all that precious metal is injected into the cracks. They tend to be vertical here, but they also go at all other angles. So here it is, they're running cross cuts here, here, and out, and this is, this is the logic of the thing. Big thing called the Edith May vein, it splits, goes down to the Hughes vein, the Adirondack splits out here, and then you just march across the veins. From the Jesse to the Lynchburg to the Croesus north and south, the Snowball vein, the Berlin vein, and several others. This is why they did that. Nobody else in the history of the Butte Hill, despite all the focus on trying to consolidate it, nobody thought of the logic of the mineralization of the hill to do that, except the North Butte Company. So, in order to really put that plan in place, they needed to use the solid rock of the Granite Mountain uh, uh, claim in order to make this state-of-the-art shaft. And so in 1909, just a couple years later, the North Butte Company sank this new shaft with all the best equipment, designed better than anything else, and they did it for the speculator mine. And it was called, of course, the Granite Mountain. By 1917, they'd sunk it 3,700 feet, deeper than any other mine by a long shot on the hill three quarters of a mile down. And so they had additional ventilation shafts. They had it all figured out about how to get them in who were so deep that how to get them good air, how to keep it safe. The spec then went from that hot, dangerous, cramped little thing into the biggest, deepest, and most productive mine in the world. Okay, the U.S. entered World War I the same year, 1917. The world needed copper. They needed copper for the telephones. It needed it to work everything and light the cities, every single of one of the thousands of new uh, electrical inventions, and they needed it to make every single bullet shell in the war. Now, what kind of men were there? Here's J.D. Moore. He's a shift boss on the 2,200-foot level. It's right in between the speculator and the granite mountain shafts in what was called the Edith May. Okay, now shift bosses knew how granite, how, how granite worked, how rock worked, how dynamite and men worked. Everything from hard rock to living flesh. Their job was telling hard men what to do in really what were the most dangerous jobs in the world at the time. Underground, loyalty among the men, because of the dangers that they shared, was really the coin. It was the coin of friendship. It was the coin of the bond between them. They watched out for each other. They watched each other's backs. So now this is just one part. It's a 200-foot level between the 2,000 station or the 2,000-foot level and the, and the 2,200. Okay, so here are the shafts. You come out from a crosscut, and it joins into the Edith May. That's This complex set of things is right above this one. Okay, this is the sheet of ore that's going up. These are what are called the stopes. They're the working stopes, and this is Moore's beat. 
He had 40 men working in these stopes. They were up on different floors, drilling, putting in dynamite, blasting, mucking out, dropping the ore down the chutes where it would be picked up by, by uh, ore cars and, and small electric motors, uh, little locomotives, and then taken back to the shaft, dumped in the ore pockets, and taken up. Very, very slick operation, but full of loose holes. The men had to be careful all the time for rock falling down, for the drills uh, malfunctioning, for the dynamite not to blow up right. Very, very dangerous. And Moore's in charge of all those guys, 40 guys. So you really have to remember, too, that in 1917, you didn't have electric flashlights all over the place. It said every single miner worked underground, thousands of feet underground, with nothing more than a few square feet of light around them from an open flame, either candles or carbide lanterns. Now, on Friday, June 8th, 1917, the manager of the North Butte, Norman Bla Braley, who was, a, who was a brilliant miner himself and had already patented multiple uh, patents for ventilation, increasing ventilation, all kinds of really brilliant stuff, he had his men lowering a 1,200-foot armored electric cable to hook up their fire prevention system. There were several parts to that, but the purpose was fire prevention. Now, the cable roughly looked like this. It was two inches in diameter, actually two and a quarter, so roughly six inches around. And there were the copper wires carrying the 5,000 volts, and then it was surrounded by, by the insulation, which was uh, a, a, an oil-soaked, varnish-soaked cambric. It was, a, it was a fabric, highly flammable. It was the best thing that they could find to dissipate heat. And then to protect it, uh, on the outside was a lead sheath about three-sixteenths of an inch thick. So on, fr on June 8th, in the morning, on Friday, they started lowering the cable down. This 1,200-foot cable weighed three tons. They started lowering it down the chippy shaft. So for 12 hours, the electricians guided the cable down. So 1,200 feet is roughly, well, here's 3,400. Here's 2,200. 1,200 feet is this. That's how long the cable was. And so it came down, came down, and they lowered it down so the front end was here at the 2,600. The, the, the tail end was here. So this is where the thing was. And so at that point, they were going to pull it in to this crosscut and attach it to the transformer because they moved the transformer as a fire prevention uh, method because uh, two claims away, the MODOK had burned from top to bottom in the shaft because of malfunctioning transformer. They were running extremely high voltage through these things, and they just had a habit of exploding into flames. And so if you had it right next to the shaft, right next to all the shaft timbers, it was a guaranteed fire hazard. So they were going to stop that. They were going to fix it. So they were going to pull that cable into the 2600 to where they'd blasted out station for the transformer, which was way away from any timber. No fire could start. And then they would hook it into their whole electric system, uh, their, their sprinkler system, the fire prevention system, um, all the signals, all the, little, the, the electric locomotives, and the few lights that they had around the stations, and they would run the whole thing, all the ventilation fans. When they were right on the forefront of the ventilation fans as well, because of Braley. Now what happened was the cable got twisted. So Hale, who was a head electrician, looked at this and thought, oh my god, well, I've got to undo those twists. So standard practice, he goes up in the chippy cage and he starts unwrapping the little hemp ropes, that are the big hemp ropes that they use to attach the 1,200-foot uh, high-voltage uh, armored cable to the, the, the uh, lift, the hoist cable, the steel cable. So he started doing that and he got 100 feet up and the cable started sliding. And he looked at that and was sliding right in front of his eyes, probably a foot, foot and a half away, this far away. And he knows, I can't, I can't, I'm out of here. So he rings the hoist engineer quickly, quickly, lower, lower, lower. And the guy's lowering him down. And he's ringing still. And, and it's going just equal to his, to his eyes as he's going fast down to the station, the 2600 station. So he's watching it loop up over the timbers. It's catching on the brackets. It's catching on the sprinklers right in front of his face. They get to the bottom. He's, he jumps out to the end of the thing. Everybody there, everybody on that station is jumping and leaping out of the way. And meanwhile, behind him comes this entire thing crashing down three tons, stripping everything out of the pump compartment of the shaft, breaking the water lines, uh, uh, smashing the fire prevention system. 
uh, ripping everything up. So then, after the last pebbles are falling and the water's trickling from the broken lines, they start in and they finally, at that point, stick their head in. Because up above them is 2,600 feet of open shaft. So they realize, after they look a little bit, that there's nothing they can do. They check the electricity, and then, totally defeated, I'm through their tails between their legs, just going. They go up to the surface, and they check in with a night foreman, Ernest Salau. So you got to understand who Salau is. He was an immigrant from Germany. He'd spent 17 years in Butte. He came when he was 20. He was 37 at this point. He'd spent 15 of those in the speculator through that entire period where it was uh, for several years when it was the hottest, most horrible place to live. And then the North Butte came in. They started doing this unprecedented development. He was there for all of that. He went from the lowest level, the mucker, to a driller, to a shift boss. And he ended up, he was, because he knew the whole mine, his hands, his individual hands had helped build that whole thing from the very beginning. And he worked his way all the way up to the assistant foreman, the night foreman. He's in charge of the entire mine. So he gets this report from the electricians. And he goes, ah, you know, there's a problem. I'll figure it out and I'm going to fix it. He writes a little note to Norman Braley. He says, Norman, cable fell, blocking shaft below 2,400. Going down to pull it out. We'll get the water pipes working and the drills back on. These are guys who just fixed problems. Never mind that this problem had never occurred before. So Sully dropped down the shaft with shift boss John Collins. Collins had pulled all of his people out from down here. He, hadn't, he was hanging out, just trying to help. So Sully and Collins go down. There's another about six or eight guys there at the 2400 station. And they're trying to figure out, in, in Collins' words, they get out of the, of, the, of the chippy cage. They squeeze out between the, uh, the plates that, that, that are safety plates and, um, and the timbers. <laughs> And they move out, and they, and they step into the open shaft. And they're looking at the, all the cable. They climb down into it, trying to figure out where the end is. And on one side, they have this giant bunch of tangled cables, shredded, ripped apart. The lead sheath is all out. The insulation's everywhere. So they've got that on one side. And on the other side of the timber below them, 600 feet of air. So Colin says, we were looking for the end of the cable for it to get a hitch on it and a chain. Shredded insulations everywhere. They poked through it, looking for the end of the cable, holding their carbide lanterns with the acetylene flame, 1,000 degrees, shooting out of the front of it. They had only started using the carbide lanterns a year before. So they didn't know it, but they were surrounded by the world's largest fire hazard and a 2,400-foot pile of kindling above them. Salau brushed some shredded trees. Uh, sh shredded tufts with his lamp, and suddenly flames came up. He, he, he reached around to get it. Flames started behind him. He slapped out the first ones, and suddenly the whole shaft was in flames. Colin said, I heard Ernest yell. He said, John, I got my lamp too close, and she took fire. So we couldn't get no good of it. She went too strong. So they frantically jumped on the cage and went up to the 2,400-foot station. They grabbed the guys there. They dumped down a keg of wa drinking water. It was the only water they had. And the flames just leaped up, and within two minutes, it had engulfed in the shaft and was all the way up to the station. Collins took the cage up. He jumped two station tenders, Pete Conroy and Pat Conroy and Pete Sheridan, who were helping there. And they jumped on the cage to go to the surface. And they got to the top, and they yelled to Joe Barnico at the top man, fire at the 2400. Conroy and Sheridan quickly uh, took off the, the, uh, the ore skips from the main lift and put on the stacked cages because they were going to they were gonna go right down because they knew all the men. They let them off and, and brought them on every single shift. They knew the guys personally on the 2200. So they changed the cages. It takes maybe, maybe two minutes. Smoke still wasn't there. There's no sign of anything up on the top. They jump in the thing. There's a big argument between Barnacote and Collins and them. They're determined to go down. They pay no attention to Collins and Barnacote who are saying the signal bells aren't working. They just say, we're going down. We're going to save our men. So they get lowered. Nothing happens. There's no signal bells. There's no signal. Total confusion. And then the hoist engineer is going, my God. It's he starts pulling them up. And they come up pillar flame as they reach the surface and come out of the shaft. The two men are incinerated, embracing each other. And 2,000 feet below, the entire shaft is a gigantic bonfire. 
Here's what a mine fire looks like above ground. This is the Alice Mine in 1906. All that smoke, instead of going up into the sky, was going out into the workings, if you can imagine, every single tunnel. So Selah was standing there. All the men were in their workplaces. He knew it. All the men were in their workplaces all across the mine. He'd worked in almost every single one of those places. He'd oversee them. He knew exactly where everybody was. And he knew they had no idea what was going on and that he'd started the fire. And he knew that word could only travel as fast as a man could run in the dark. They wouldn't know unless he got to them. So Selau took over. He yelled at the others in the stations. He divided them up, directed them to go out in certain places and to, to spread the word to stop people from coming toward the Granite Mountain shaft. He himself went from the station, it's a 2400 station, straight out of here into the Edith May because he knew there were at least 60 men working right here. Uh, this is 800 feet between the shafts. So he's got maybe four or 500 here, and then he's going to go. The, the reason there are all these weird little parallel things and all these different uh, uh, pathways there is because the ore veins split up, and, and there's stopes running up and down from each one of those places. So Sully's running along, and he's stopping at every single place where the compressed air, hose co or air, compressed air pipe comes in, and, and there's a T-junction that goes up into the stope. He turns off the valve, smashes a hammer on the thing so the guys up there aren't deafened by their drill and can hear him. And he screams, get out to the high ore, go to the south. Because he knows that on the 2,400 foot level, they have to run here away from the fire and then out this direction to about 1,500 extra feet to the high ore mine. It's the only way out. But the problem was most men didn't know where to go. Sully led two groups out. He came back in each time, gathered another group, took them out to the high ore. He met yet another, a third group, and, and mapped for them where to go, how to get out. And then what did he do? He went running out here because he knew the other place in the mine where there were maybe 80 or 90 men working was out here in the snowball vein. So he ran all the way out there, got Jack Bronson, who was there, and, and a guy named McFadden, and they went down to the 2600. And the reason they went down into the 2600 was because... That level is a total island. It doesn't connect to any other mine. It's completely cut off. And the only way for any men coming up from below or the men on that level, the only way out is to climb straight up. Here's where some of the men were working. Could you imagine being stuck in this labyrinth? And you really only know, most of them, one way, which was how to get back to the granite mountain shaft because that's where you were let down. Instead, instead of going out that pathway, you have to actually go clear over here to the speculator mine. How do you get through that? Well, you don't, unless you know or can find somebody who does. Sully knew, and he, this is exactly where he was headed. For the men needing to climb out, this is the vertical section. Okay? Every place there's red here is a vein. There, there's... If this was a little higher resolution, you could see, like right here, you see these little squares. That's where there's a stope going up, right? And so it, what is it doing? It's going up into ladder ways, like this. But if you're down here and you choose the wrong thing, and you go up it, and it stops, you have to know which ladder way to take, or you're caught in this. Now, one group on the 2600 came up from a little bit below, and they were herded along by a guy named George Falutovich, and they went straight to the Granite Mountain shaft. And he said, Falutovich, Serbo-Croatian, says, we see that granite fa shaft all on fire. And some of them men, they holler and cry. They throw the hats, they throw the coats off, and they swear and pray and everything like that. Other men as the smoke came out and through these different things, the smoke would come out one down into the other. It was coming up and down, depending on the level that it was inv invading from, either up or down, and the men were caught in between. Old Fetty is a guy who is, who is a survivor who was uh, uh, interviewed. He said, we didn't know what the trouble was. Smoke and gas went ahead of us, and we turned around. Then the smoke came down the rays behind us, and we were caught between two smokes. The only thing we could do is go any place we could find. So you get the feeling of the franticness of the, of the men. They don't know where to go. They're just trying to get away. Here's what was happening. The Granite Mountain's a downcast. 
Okay, air from the surface, 6,300 feet, June 8th, air's freezing. The air comes down the shaft in a normal flow, in the normal circuit, and then it goes across, and the spec is an upcast. So what happens if suddenly you completely screw everything up and you have a fire down here with all this cold air coming down? If you've ever tried to light a fire in a cold, cold cabin, right, unless you get that air going up the chimney, the entire cabin fills with smoke, and that's what happened. This gigantic, if you recall back to that picture of the mine fire, all that smoke is coming up here. It's pushing, pushing, but it's got a 2,400-foot column of cold air pushing down that's already going down by five, six, eight miles an hour. And so all that smoke is just pouring out here, pours out, pours over here, all across the connecting drifts, and then it goes up. And then it comes out into the, into the sections between. So the men who are here, what happens? All we could do was go any place we could find. They're trapped from every direction. This is a section from the story. Winder and Vocal came out of their work area and start, charged straight toward the 2200 Granite Mountain shaft with the others, straight at the fire. As they neared the station, the black wall of smoke rolled down their tunnel. Man after man in front of them kept going, disappearing into it, trying to reach the station. The farther they went, the blacker and more hideous it became. The lamps went out. The men dropped to their forearms and knees, crawling with their noses on the rail, choking, gasping, sipping the last breath of air on the ground. Winder realized something was desperately wrong. He couldn't breathe. He was crawling toward death. He turned around and grabbed Voko. Voko, who's crying out, I'm dying, I'm dying. Winder punched him in the face and pulled him up and dragged him up, and they started going back out of the smoke. But the men right behind them shoved them out of the way and crawled right over the top of Voko, clawing their way toward the station, thinking they were escaping, but instead going directly into the fire. Winder and Voko retreated out of the smoke and lay exhausted until they staggered up and ran for their lives, joining dozens of other men fleeing to escape south through the tunnels out to the high ore. To escape, the men needed three things. They needed time, they needed the tools to get through the bulkheads, and they needed a place to go. And if you had only two, it's not enough. So the fire intensified in the shaft like a blast furnace, and so waves of black smoke are coming up, big pulses, all across the connecting drifts, sealing off escape. The timbers lining the mine shaft are wet from the groundwater that's pouring out of the fissures. And so what it's doing is incompletely combusting. It's putting all this huge black smoke that's just filled with high, high concentrations of carbon monoxide. So you have to understand what carbon monoxide does. It accumulates in the blood. It bonds with the hemoglobin and takes the place of oxygen. So you suffocate from the inside out. And somebody who's got tremendously bad carbon monoxide poisoning, their blood and their veins are a bright cherry red. So here's that schematic again. You see it looks like it's a straight shot from one shaft to the other. But no, this is what's in between. Here's one shaft, here's the other shaft. All of this stuff is in between. Where do you go? Unless you know where to go, you can't tell. Now, a group of 29 men, out of all the different groups, staggering, trying to go everywhere, they've been cut off. Some have been cut off to the north. Some have been cut off to the south. Some had tried to get out kind of the east and west, and they couldn't do it. And they ended up right around here. And one of them was a man named Manus Dugan. The men were desperate. They're trying to escape. They're, they, 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 they don't know each other. Dugan's a nipper. He actually understands. He's been working there for 10 years, and he knows how the mine is set up. And so they're saying, we need to blast our way out. We'll just get dynamite. We'll do anything. We'll wrap uh, our, our wet Macintoshes around our head and just run through the smoke. And Dugan lets them go back and forth and back and forth. They're all hysterical. And he says, finally, when they're just out of it, he says, listen to me, boys. You can suit yourself, but my advice is to bulk head in. That's what I'm going to do, and I recommend you do the same. And what he meant was to seal themselves in to their own tomb, build a wall that's airtight, and hope that the air inside their chamber lasted long enough for the gas to clear outside before they suffocated. It seemed like suicide is their only option, 
And if you can imagine, this, this small-framed man convinced 28 other hysteric men to do just that, to seal themselves in their own tomb. So they gathered timbers and boards and canvas fan piping and tools, and they built back in this area here. He knew that there was a dead-end tunnel right here, a 2471C. It was straight out away, about 1,500 feet from the Granite Mountain shaft. The smoke was coming, and he took them out here. And they built their bulkhead, and they began what was a 38-hour wait against the deadly gas. On the other side of the Granite Mountain shaft, up here on the 2,200 foot, so they're down here on the 24, to get there you'd have to go up, and then here was J.D. Moore. And he, he was working this area here, and he grabbed 10 of his men. He could not get over to the speculator and then out the high ore. He was trying to do it. He breathed tremendously heavy gas. He was really, really, uh, his lungs were, were horribly injured. And he, and he knew then that the men that were over on this side would not be able to get out. And so he turned around and came right back and went down through the stove, brought him out here, and, and pulled him out into the, into the crosscut there at the 2254. So it was really where the worst of the gas was coming. They were, had to retreat. And the men were totally terrified, and some tried to rebel against him. They wanted to wet their shirts. They wanted to just run for it. And Moore knew that if they ran for it, they were dead. So he took two guys, slammed them against the wall, and said, if you want to die, you go that way. If you want to live, come with me. So he directed them back, all the way back out into the farthest place away, so this paradoxical thing, in order to be safe, you have to run away from what you think is safety. And you can imagine when men are totally panicked, how do you get that thought into them? So he took his men out into that crosscut, and they started their bulkhead. Short section from the book. They were as far as they could go. Moore tore open a compressed air hose off a drill and jammed it into John Lissa's hands. Keep the gas back. Lissa jumped over the side of the growing bulkhead and pulled the hose in front of the posts they'd nailed in, loose coils at his feet. Moore yelled, open it full, roof to floor, side to side. He's spraying it like a fire hose. He aimed the nozzle down the drift and the air hissed loudly in a powerful stream, almost wrenching the hose from his hands. Dirt and dust flew up from the floor and the dark fumes boiled back. They set posts across the bottom. They nailed lagging boards between the posts and the timber sits above it. And then they... Actually, they, then they started ripping their clothes off. They ran out of canvas air pipe. They would rip their clothes off, stripped them out, nailed them on, slapped mud on them. I said, humidity, 100%, 95%. The pounding of hammers echoes down the drift, a hollow clap of wood boards and clothes ripping, of mud being slopped into the cracks, men's short clipped voices sounding as they fought for life with their backs against a, a wall of solid rock. You almost got it, yelled Lissa. His voice trembled and his back was brushing the bulkhead. No, yelled Moore between hammer strokes. Shoot it toward the floor. The gas is sneaking under the smoke. I can taste it. The last of the boards were nailed. All their shirts and pants had been used. Bring in the hose, yelled Moore. Lissa turned to the bulkhead, handed the hose in through the hole to Garrity and jumped through the opening. Without the restraining pressure, the smoke broke like a wave into the wall. From inside, Garrity aimed the hose at the hole, keeping the pressure on. Moore set the last board in place, nailed it. Lissa stripped himself. He split, Moore split open the pants and nailed, and nailed the class of the clothing over the lagging, and the wall was closed. Suddenly, all they heard was the deafening hiss from the air hose. Moore closed the valve and stillness filled the chamber. A carbide lantern threw light on the men. Dirt streaked and naked, eyes wild, chests heaving and falling. They stared at each other uncertainly, tools still in their hands, tense and abruptly aware of how small the space was for the ten of them. The bright little flame of the carbide lamp, lamp sang, barely audible, thin and high-pitched like a tiny plaintive cry. Sitting down, Bear asked, Leaning against the gritty bulkhead, Moore let out a sigh of exhausted relief and thought, we did it. Then he looked around at the men, each one in turn, and said, good work, boys. So they're out at the end of that crosscut, one on the far left. Up above, all hell is breaking loose, total chaos, smoke's coming out of both shafts, and 
the men are, are just haphazardly trying to form safety teams. They're gathering these what are called helmets, this apparatus, this rebreather and oxygen-charged rebreather, just incredibly primitive equipment. And so they start down trying to rescue people in the upper, upper levels. So Manager Braley starts shooting water down the main shaft. And when it hits the fire, the superheated rock just explodes. And the whole shaft starts collapsing from the 1,000-foot level to below the 2,400-foot level. And in there is this thick, poisonous mixture of steam, gas, and smoke. It makes it just this deadly murk that's pushed out into all the tunnels. And here's what the men are doing. They know the guys down there. It could just be them. And this is what they're going to do. They're not going to hold back. They're just going to go for it to try to find anybody they can to save them. And they go down into the murk, that poisonous. And they search level by level across miles of tunnels and in many cases feeling their way along the, the railroad tracks. And, but the mine was too huge and there are too many places. Nobody knew that the bulkheads were there and that somewhere, somewhere down in the rock, down the mazes of tunnels and through the thousands of feet of poison gas, there were men living in the darkness, supporting each other from the aloneness and using up their lock oxygen slowly. Behind Dugan's bulkhead on the 2400, they kept watch. They'd wrap on the rails in the compressed air pipe and check, pull out the shirt that they had in a little hole to check the gas outside. After 24 hours, the air behind the bulkhead was bad. The lamps went out, not enough oxygen. Men were writhing on the floor. Dugan wrote, Sunday, 1 a.m. I realize that all oxygen has been consumed, everybody breathing heavily. If death, death comes, it will be caused by all oxygen used in the chamber. Another man said, no water to drink, nothing to eat, foul air. The carbide lamps and the candle don't work. My matches won't light, and they're good matches. Men were getting desperate. They want to burn up the bulkhead, commit suicide. They cannot stand the suffering. We're wrapped on the pipe and made out that someone was coming. We wrapped a million times. It's all fake. No one will ever show. Moore was on the other side, trying to keep his men, keep their spirits up. He broke the glass of his watch so he could feel the hands and tell what time it was in the dark. He'd breathed heavy smoke. He's carbon, he's poisoned with carbon monoxide, and yet he tried to keep his men optimistic. He joked, he helped them. And he wrote to his wife, Dear Pet, this may be the last message you'll get from me. The gas broke about 11.15, and I tried to get the men out, but the smoke was too strong. I got some of the boys with me in a drift. We put in a bulkhead. His letters quickly went negative. After five hours only, he said, Dear Pet, we're all waiting for the end. I guess it won't be long. We take turns rapping on the pipe, so if the rescue crew is around, they'll hear us. Try not to worry. I know you will. But trust in God. Everything will come out all right. We will meet again with love to my pet, and may God take care of you. Your loving Jim. Behind the bulkhead, the men were dying. Blackness filled the chamber like a solid substance, infusing blindness into their eyes, stealing their vision of each other and their, of shapes of everything around them. Hope had weakened and given way to desperation. But Moore's will rose up from the haze of the gas poisoning. He roused himself. He talked with the men. He rapped on the pipe. He kept hope alive for when the rescuers came. He crawled from man to man with the water, holding the small wooden keg, tipping it to give them a drink or wetting their lips. And as the hours ebbed from Saturday into Sunday, and from Sunday into Monday, they spoke in a low, broken phrase as tormented by a slurry of blackness, bad air, mud, and pain that surrounded them. More had started to drift. Martha lay next to him near the bulkhead. Lazakite said into the blackness, I want to die. And Moore roused himself, you can't give up, Stanley. Think of your wife, your children. You can live. The air within the bulkhead had been breathed and rebreathed a million times. Their eyes ached for light to see one another, anything that might tell them who they are and that they were alive. And inside each of them, the fine architecture of life, the heart itself, began to misfire and weaken and slowly started to fail. 
Dugan's out here, 28 men. Moore's up 200 feet and there. After a day and a half, Dugan's men took out the shirt and they realized the air is clearing. And Dugan whispered to the men around him, he said, are you ready to take the gambler's chance? Now's the time. And they broke down the bulkhead. They tore off the boards. And the new air flooded in. The men woke up from the thick, blurred dreams of the dead. They stirred and groaned. The air had come from the June morning, so far above. From a world with a sun, a world with light, coming thousands of feet down the shaft and into the workings, pushing out the poison and smoke. And the men could smell life in it. They were hungry for it. And hope rose again. And as the fresh coolness washed over them, one man took a deep breath and said, My God, air. Dugan broke out. He was in the lead. They had almost a straight shot down to the speculator. He came here and he was way in front of everybody else. He checked all around the shaft collar, all around the shaft there for the signal bells. Because unless you can tell the engineer that you're there and where you are, you will never get hoisted. They will never come. So he couldn't find them. And so he knew another way out. And he turned around, went all the way out through that crosscut to a manway out there in the snowball thing, which is where he worked. That's why he knew it. And so he started to climb up 2,000 feet to save his men. The other men behind him followed, but they didn't know the mine. So they got to the station. There were no signal cord there. They couldn't do anything. And they got desperate. Two of the men held one of the other one's hand, and he leaned into the shaft, 600 feet of empty air below him, and he felt along. He feels the housing, the metal housing for the signal cord, and he reaches around. He feels the guides, and he can't find anything, and he swipes his hand across the center of the shaft. Imagine your total blackness. You're leaning over this thing. You know it's 600 feet. It's total. This is death, and the guys are holding his hand, and his hand brushes something, the signal cord. He brings it in. He starts ringing. He rings nine bells for danger, and then six and four, the 2400. On the surface, the hoist engineer's been taking rescuers up and down, everything above the 20, the 2000, and at the lowest, the 2200. And so he hears danger, that nine bells, and he's on it like that. He's going, danger, where? And then he hears six and four, and he's going, there's nobody on the 2400. And then he hears it again. As the guys down there are slowly counting out, they have to concentrate to count out exactly the right signal bell pulse. Six and four, nine for danger. Men alive on the 2400. The rescuers went down. They found a group of naked men lying by the shaft, bodies scraped, smeared with mud, blinking at the first light they'd seen. And on the surface... Everybody was rejoicing. My God, my God, the crowd cheered and men hugged each other, slapping backs, crying out as the rescued men came up. It's a miracle, a total miracle. And then they realized that Dugan wasn't with them. Their leader had disappeared. He'd saved 25 men, and he was missing. Albert Cobb was one of the men behind that group. He came up and blinked with the light. He was a jokester, and he joked on the outside, but he was overwhelmed with relief and desperate to see his wife. He peeled himself away from the first aid and celebrating crowd and went down the ridge. He cut past the diamond mine and down through Centerville, walking as fast as he could along the tracks that split the gray, gray rock and wake up Jim against the 10 foot high wooden fence of the mountain con mine yard. He made it to the upper blocks of Wyoming Street, heart pounding. He reached the tiny yard, his clothes still reeking from the bulkhead. Their dog started barking, its hair standing on end. He didn't recognize his master. He spoke to it, commanded it, but the dog wouldn't let him come in. His wife burst out of the house yelling, Albert, Albert, and the neighbor stepped into the street, but smelling the horrendous odor of the bulkhead, the smoke, the putrid air, the dog would not let him pass. She tore into the house in a frenzy and grabbed a shirt and a pair of his pants, threw them over the fence, and he shed his filthy clothes, put the new ones on, shirt inside out, opened the gate, and the dog leaped for joy, and his wife flung himself on him. <laughs> I knew it would end like this, she said. I never quit. This is one of Montana's most important sagas. It's really a story. It's a monument 
to what Montana contributed to the entire making of the modern world, the toughness of the people, the determination, the kind of men who built this country. It's also, after, in the aftermath, this massive change in safety and ventilation as a whole system's collapse. All we know it for is the disaster, but what it did was it rippled out and changed the entire industry. It was all part of the change to recognize labor, recognize the people who were working so hard to make the mines work and all the other industries. 168 men died, but 240 lived. And the full story, really, of I've just given you the sampling. What happened behind Moore's bulkhead is both heartbreaking and inspiring. And this is what men do when they're thrust into life and death situations that strip them to the core. So we see everything that people can be. So this really isn't a mining story per se. What it is is a story about the deepest part of the human spirit. People trying to survive in a totally inhuman environment. And it's a story about us, each one of us here, who we are and what we can be. The truth is that some people will rise up no matter what the odds and they'll do what's needed. And I find that, personally, a profound beauty and an inspiration within all the hard, hard, heartache and sadness. Really, the greatest things that people are capable of come from the deepest sacrifices. And that's as true today as it was in the tunnels of the speculator, and it always will be. The story shows that when everything that sustains us is gone, the water, the light, even the air we need to breathe, that the greatest darkness will still be lit by heroes. Thank you. So I'd like to thank the Butte Silverbow Archives, the wonderful ladies there, the World Museum of Mining, helped uh, in, in multiple ways. The Butte Mining Engineers, Floyd Bossard, who unfortunately passed away a couple of months ago, Larry Hoffman, Dave Me Kneebone, and the people of Butte who still live with this in their souls. So thank you very much. I'm very pleased and, and, and honored that you came. I'm very grateful. If you have any questions about any aspect that you've heard of or what I've said, I'll be happy to entertain it. Yeah. Stope, yeah. A stope is a kind of a scaffolding. When they, when they, when they uh, broach a vein, th usually the vein, but it could also be like a, a big ore body, like this room, and it might go up for hundreds of feet. And so what they'll do is they will, uh, it's the working part of the mine where the ore is, and the stope is where the men are actually drilling in and blasting out sections. And so typically what they'll do if it's a vein, it might be anywhere from a, a foot and a half wide to maybe 10 or 12 feet wide. And so what they have to do is they put an interlocking kind of scaffolding of, of, of timber up in, and they build it up as they take the ore out, right? And so it's the scaffolding. It's like a scaffolding outside of a building, and that's the stope. It's the working part of the mine where the ore is. Yeah. It did, but the problem was is that the, uh, the entire compressed air system, the pipes went through the shaft, and so it, they failed after about five hours. But yes, then they used it that way. That's probably the only reason that anybody in Moore's bulkhead lived. But yeah, uh, but they were very, very concerned, you know, about <laughs> was gas getting in, was the line broken? Um, so yeah, it, what's remarkable is that so few of the men realized what the compressed air could do. There's an incredible story in there where two guys, in the midst of just this chaos, they fall on the compressed air line and they poke a hole in it and then they breathe on it, okay? And they were actually there in the upper part of the mine on the 700 foot level and um, the air cleared up there first because of what happened with the ventilation fans. Braley reversed all the fans and tried to blow all the smoke out and there was the first area, otherwise they would have been dead. Everybody was dead around them. And they kind of rose out of that. So, but uh, haphazard, if more men could have realized that, that more would have been saved. The problem with this structurally is, is that um, all the things that were set up for safety 
when the fire changed, they all became hazards, right? You can plan a system so it's like, oh, okay, that door, that door is going to help us. We're going to close it because there's smoke out there, and then we'll go out this door. Okay, what happens if there's smoke in here, right here, and that door is closed? The thing that saved you from the one kills you in the other. And that's what the problem is in very complex ways all throughout this. The best laid plans of mice and men, right? And that's what happened. Is it just the, 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 they, they had a mind that was huge. And Braley, they were right. They were pioneers in the ventilation. Think of it this way. Ventilation gives oxygen to the men who are working. It's great. takes all the bad air away. So what does a fire feed on? Oxygen. If you've got great ventilation that's flowing from here out into the lobby and you've got a fire here, guess what happens out in the lobby? All that smoke just goes right out there faster than anything because you've got great ventilation. All the things, and you can just go through, there are dozens of things like that. And they didn't see that. Or else they thought of it and they thought it wouldn't go work like that. What I realized when I was working with the mine engineers is that they think of ventilation in terms of equilibrium flow. Actually, you know, my, my background in, in whitewater kayaking, I also have a degree in physics, but, um, but in whitewater kayaking, where you're dealing with chaos, is what allowed me to understand a great deal about what was going on in the mine and add to what was known. So what happens is, is that equilibrium flow is when everything's stable, right? And then you get this flow. Th the problem here is everything's unstable. Everything just changed. What happens between that initial change when the fire's suddenly down there and there's smoke pouring out and heat coming up in the next hour? Braley reversed the fans because he was thinking, well, okay, well, it's going to clean everything out. Yeah, it took between six hours and three days. And the, and the carbon monoxide and the smoke were so dense that the men had, in some cases, three breaths or even just a couple of minutes. And that's what happened. So um, I don't want to dwell, dwell on death. The problem is, is that th these are men, they're, they're absolutely as smart as anybody here and probably anybody anywhere, right? And so they think, and all this lesson is, is directly into us, right? The things that we think we've got nailed, that's where we're going to screw up, right? And it's just a general lesson about planning, right, for the things, especially in a situation like this. And I just have uh, incredible respect for these guys. My God, you know, it's th everything about it, they're, they're, uh, they're jury rigging things, even though they've got the methods, because the earth down there is more complicated, even on a straight vein, even in the stope, where they're just blasting. There are fissures, there's water coming in. You can't predict everything. Right? And so that's really kind of the, the creativity of the thing, is how do people live in environments that are threatening, but you need to be there? The whole world's, I mean, if you think about it, 60% of the copper that was used in the world at that time was used in the United States. 40% of that came from Butte. Okay, what that really means, what the numbers mean, is that the copper industry catapulted the U.S. from an agrarian you know, rural society into a world power in about two decades, right? All those other things are dependent on electricity, everything. It's, it's like ground zero for the making of the modern world. There are a few places like that, you know, where everything's happening all right there. Butte's like a microcosm of the most astonishing things, both socially, in terms of industry, in, t in terms of the metallurgy. Modern... Civilization runs on metals. Every single civilizational change is, depends on what metal is being worked. You start with stone, you go to the Copper Age, you go to the Bronze Age, you go to the Iron Age, you go to the Steel Age, silicone, and now we're at a peculiar place where kind of all of those things are blended together for reasons that people don't have any idea, you know, I mean, we can never predict. My wife's uh, mi and I's middle daughter is in nanophysics in graduate school, right? Unbelievable stuff happened in there. Nobody could predict it. So this is one of those eras. And what I like is I like looking at that picture that I showed of the men, right? You look at their faces, and it's just like looking out at your faces or you looking at mine. These are individuals. They're men and their families. They have, they have passion. They're going to live. They're going to find a better way to live. They're going to... They're gonna do what they can. They're going to put all their chips on the line. And that's what makes civilization work, is because it's worth it. It was worth it to them. Yeah? Uh, 
thank you very much. Totally agree. I totally agree. Uh, uh, one thing I'll say is that if you go up to the Granite Mountain Memorial, all you have to do is get on, park, go across. When you get to Maine, you just go straight up the hill. When you are almost to the Lexington mine frame, there will be a little sign chipped in the granite there saying Granite Mountain Memorial. And you follow that road, you go over to the east side, and you can look out on the Granite Mountain head frame. Okay, and if you do that, and you look around, it's, it's a very poignant spot. Um, kind of looking out at the desolation, you know, that's left from 100, 150 years of mining. But also think about the thousands of men that were below there. And do one other thing, which is you go over to the north part and stand there. And then you look down, because under your feet, seven football fields, 2,200 feet, is where J.D. Moore and his group were, right below you. That's just an, an irony or an artifact of how they chose that. So we'll put up some little plaque of that. But thank you very much. That's exactly right. It's one of these hidden things that kind of lies underneath everything we do. Just take two minutes sometime and, and just go through all the things that you depend on that require metals and copper. There won't be a single one. Your clothes, your heating. I, I could go through this, but I, it's everything. So and just think that this is a core part of our life. How do we make it? How do we weave it in? to our realization of how the world works. Anything else? Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. If, if, if you're interested, I'll be out signing books um, or answering questions if you'd like. Thank you.